Smith. Yes. Michael Smith? Oh, the microphone. Oh, yes. You have to speak into the microphone. Um, uh, my question is actually for Dr. Sachs. And, and you were, I, I read this. The, the, this, has been, this data has been waited for for a long time, I think. It's a couple of years now that, that it's been a signal that this stuff was, was better in terms of the, the, this, these safety signals. <coughs> But then you said this is promising results. I mean, this seems to me uh, almost a home run. I wonder mean, if you comment yeah, on that. Yeah, the, the, the reason why it's, it's not quite a home run, and I'm a huge baseball fan, so uh, it, I'd say it's more like a, a solid single or a double is because the, the, the long-term clinical effects are not yet known, because we have only this sort of 48-week experience. Um, but it strongly suggests that it will be safer in the long run for the kidneys and the bones than the existing TDF. Okay, um, Ed? Oh, I'm sorry, you have the microphone. Yeah. Since you Hi, did. thank you. Um, Jeff Barry, Positively Wear Magazine, hi. Um, so can you tell me um, therapeutic drug monitoring, how is it done with TAF? Is it different? Is it at the plasma level or is it intracellularly? And <coughs> if, if it is, um, is that going to be an additional barrier for physicians or clinicians who want to perform therapeutic drug monitoring and, is, uh, and for studies going forward? So, so right, right now, therapeutic drug monitoring is really not part of standard of care management. So fortunately, uh, we don't need to do it because our drugs are so effective. Uh, the PK study that I showed you was only in a very small subset of the participants, and it measured both plasma tenofovir concentrations and PBMC intracellular concentrations of the active component, confirming what had been seen before. But it was, it's not something that would translate to clinical practice. If I could modify your question a little bit, one of the benefits we think of TAF is it will require less in the way of long-term renal monitoring, uh, which is not such a big deal in the United States, but is potentially a huge deal in resource-limited settings if the safety of the drug is, is borne out. Thank you. And then just one more question for Dr. Makomsky. Um, did you see any differences in facial hyperatrophy between the groups? No, unfortunately, we relied on DEXA and CT, so we did not quite look at facial lipoatrophy, and that has been, I mean, I've done lipodystrophy research for a while now. That, that's always an issue because there's no objective way to do it, and using calipers and anthropometrics has not really captured facial lipoatrophy well. <coughs> Okay. Ed? Yeah, Ed Sussman with uh, MedPage today. For um, Dr. McConsey, um one of the problems in doing um, studies in this area has been that we, we really don't know how to, what these patients look like before they became HIV infected. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. What do you do to try and correct for that? Yeah, I mean, luckily, uh, you know, the arms were well uh, balanced at baseline, but you're exactly correct. When people say, how do you know a patient has lipodystrophy, you don't know what their limb fat was before HIV. Uh, you don't know, in a lot of cases clinically, what it was before treatment. So uh, somebody could, you know, walk into my clinic with 20 kilograms of limb fat, another could walk with five. So losing 10% for one is gonna be a nothing uh, versus the other. So you're absolutely correct. Unless we have like the max cohort, a cohort following high risk people and getting DEXA scans on them before they seroconvert, uh, we're not gonna be able to answer that question. And DEXAs are very expensive, so it's unlikely that this will be done, unfortunately. And uh, a question for uh, Dr. Mercier. Um, the bottom line on this is that less than 20% of the patients who um, tried to stop smoking with a, with, with uh, um, varenicline, I can't, I can never pronounce that, uh, actually ended up not smoking after 48 weeks. Um, is that a significantly large enough number to actually try interventions in this group with an expensive medication? The difference is the same that uh, in the general populations, in the literature. Uh, in mean, 10% uh, with a placebo, 15% uh, with a bupropion, uh, and 
20-25% uh, uh, with uh, varenicline. And in Israel, is uh, the same result. I think it's a good, a good question for uh, some modeling in terms of, you know, the benefit. If you get one person to quit smoking, what the long-term costs of the morbidity associated with smoking, that metric has been done and the drug is used in the general population. Uh, you know, I think certainly we're not going to rest with that 17, 18 percent and say we don't have to do any more work in this area, but it's good to know that it is at least similarly effective. Um, next. Yep, uh, Gus Cairns, AIDS map. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, for Dr. Massey, um, two things really. Firstly, how sustained was the effect? Uh, did you measure up to a year or in terms of um, cessation? And the other thing is, um, I just looked, um, you saw a, quite a high um, prevalence of um, serious adverse events, grade three, four, 10% and 6% psychiatric. That doesn't sound great. In the study, we have uh, 248 patients included and um, 102 in, uh, in the varvenicline group and 11 and 11, and uh, 111 in the placebo group. And we have uh, 15 adverse events, grades 3 and 4, uh, drug-related, yes, uh, 9 are psychiatric adverse events, uh, and uh, 6 uh, are also gastro gastrointestinal disorders, as we observe in the general population. You, yeah, I was just, oh right, so it's the same rates as you would see in the general yes. population, okay. And they are mainly what exactly the psychiatric mm -hmm. side effects, what are they? It was uh, two depression, uh -huh. yes, nightmares, uh -huh. with once uh, hallucination. Uh, insomnia, uh -huh. behavioral disorders, hallucination, sleep disorders. Uh. Yeah. And my second question was how long did you measure, measure the, the um, cessation for? Uh, how, long did you, how long did it last? Did you do a one year measurement or what? How long were they followed? Yeah, how long were they followed? Well, Following, the follow-up uh, uh, was uh, 48 weeks, uh -huh. oh, right. one year. Okay, all right. And I'm afraid I've got one for Dr. McComsey as well. Your study uncovered this extraordinary relationship between, I think it was baseline viral load and fat gain. Mm -hmm. Is that just, um, and is that a sort of combination of, of, of the effect of having a high viral load at baseline and then starting treatment? Or is it just in patients that had a high viral load and you just, they just gained weight during the follow-up period? Uh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. But uh, if, if you remember that slide I, uh, I showed about the influence of baseline viral load, so a third of patients started with high viral load above 100,000 and two-thirds with, with lower viral load. So even starting on the same regimen, the high viral load gained double to triple the amount of fat than people on the lower viral load. So, so there's definitely something there. And even, you know, going back to ACTG 5224, you know, that I presented a few years back, there seemed to be a similar effect of baseline viral load, but I think here we'll put it more into perspective uh, and analyze it in a better way. So it does matter where you start with. And I think that that's what I wanted people to get is that another reason to start people perhaps right away on drugs, not wait till their viral load is high or their CD4 is low. 
So what do you think is going on there? Why does a high viral load make you gain fat? Yeah, it could be, part, well, make you gain more fat on drugs, right? Uh, it could be that what Julie said is that people with high viral load were sicker in a way, even though that we were not able to uh, catch that by our baseline characteristics. So they were sicker, so return to health required more gain in fat to return to their baseline yeah. before HIV, since we don't have a baseline, like someone correctly pointed out. Uh, so it could be partly a, bo a more brisk return to health for these people that were sicker before drugs. And we're gonna look at that a little bit more to see how much inflammation play a role in that. Um, even though our initial analysis, even accounting for different inflammation markers, that observation remained correct about the baseline viral load influence in the fat gains. And remember, that was for peripheral fat as well as central fat, as well as lean body mass. I didn't show that, but any, any kind of gains in any compartment, having a high baseline viral load, you gain much more than having a lower baseline viral load. Hello, my name is Veronica Rosida from France. My question is for Paul Sachs. Um, how many people were concerned with uh, serious adverse effects with stenophobia? And how many people have had uh, a significant improvement? Uh, this is my first question. And my second question uh, is, uh, when will you be licensing the, uh, the new medication? What price? And uh, do you indicate this medication for people who have adverse events or for everybody? So if, you're talk if the first question is about in general practice, in general HIV practice, how commonly do we see problems with tenofovir? Um, I really thought that Amanda Mockroft's presentation before mine really did a, did a nice job of kind of estimating the risk. Renal disease is very multifactorial, and when we uh, look at our HIV patients, the ones who are least likely to get into trouble with renal disease are the young, otherwise healthy ones, and they hardly ever have any problems with tenofovir at all. It's largely the older patients who've been on tenofovir a long time uh, who are getting into tenofovir trouble. And remember, the drug was approved in 2001, so we've had it for quite some time now. And they're starting to have other causes of renal disease, like high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, kick in. And trying to sort out what's contributing is more and more difficult, and it's become more and more common in clinical practice to have to take people off tenofovir because of that reason. Uh, as far as when the drug is going to be approved, the filing just took place, and you know, for this particular co-formulation, uh, it'll be reviewed in the United States at least by the end of this this year, and then the uh, next formulation, which is the um, TNF, the TAF FTC two drug combination for use with different drugs, uh, will be sometime in the following year. Uh, as far as the price, I, I really have no idea. One or two more questions. Uh, this is Fred Scheich, IFR TV. And uh, this question is for Grace McComsey. I just wanted to know if, uh, I appreciate you're doing this research in uh, body habitus change, and is there any other culprits that you may be believe would be out there? And first of all, is the study that you've done fairly conclusive that you don't need to do any further research? You feel comfortable in that? And if, if so, then is there any other culprits that you might like to investigate? Because this is something that a lot of people are concerned about, living with HIV, something that's going to cause lipoatrophy, or, or any body habits changes that are unfriendly. I can tell you for lipoatrophy, I think the re it, it's getting really hard, harder and harder to be able to do such studies because there are so few people who have new incidents of lipoatrophy in the U.S., which is a good thing. Uh, but with the you know, lack of use of uh, D4T and AZT anymore, we're not seeing those. So lipoatrophy seemed to be linked to a big part to mitochondrial toxicity. So that I don't think we're going to see a lot of research on. In terms of the central adiposity, yes. I mean, that's a problem that we're seeing a lot in our clinic. And I think now, I mean, even the NIH has different RFAs specifically targeting the fat changes in HIV, and I think they mean more the hypertrophy because they recognize that that's a big problem still in our patients, men and women, and women seem to have even a bigger problem with their weight and their central adiposity. 
So I mean, you know, on one hand, yes, on the central uh, hypertrophy. But it's more fat in the general population that's getting HIV that's then being uh, augmented as well, yeah, too. I think, I think uh, that's really right. important. As the population is getting really, yeah. you know, the, our BMI, I mean, if you look at the studies, whether naive or not, the BMI is just creeping up. I think you're right, Judy. It's a combination of obesity as well as central fat accumulation from HIV. It's really two different components. Okay, one more question? Yes, thanks. Jennifer Johnson with The Well Project. And uh, this is two similarly themed questions. Um, one for Dr. McComsey, and you just started to touch on this, which is, were there any sex-based differences in uh, the increase in fat that you saw? And the second would be for Dr. Lowe. I'm just curious to know how many of your study participants were women. It's a great question, and I think it hurts Judy and I to say that despite all our attempts, we had 10% women on the study. And it, it's really hard, and that speaks. I've had better luck with local studies in Cleveland with the percent of women, but it's, it's always been the issue of being able to enroll women as much as we try. So I, I can't say with 10%, we really couldn't conclude anything on gender. Yeah, but I would say that in the overall study, it was, it was over 20%, and we're going to do more analyses of the, the 1,800 people in the main study to try to extrapolate these results, because we do have self-collected, self-reported body fat changes in those, and measurements and measurements. So we have more to come looking at women. We're not going to give up. Yeah. And, and Janet? And in our randomized trial, we had about 20% women. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions and your uh, attention. So thank you all to the presenters for your work. Absolutely.